Palace is located in the southeastern corner of Europe in the Mediterranean Sea on the Peloponnesus and Attica peninsulas, extending into the Ionian Sea and Asian Sea, which are subdivisions of the Mediterranean. The Chalkidiki Peninsula extends from Macedonia into the Aegean Sea. Today, this is the most visited tourist paradise of Greece. Thessaloniki was founded by the brother-in-law of Alexander the Great to honor his wife, Thessaloniki. The present modern settlement is the second largest city of the country, simultaneously the capital of Macedonia, an important harbor, trade and cultural center, where we can make ourselves familiar with the grand memories of the Greek, Roman, Byzantine, and Christian cultures. We approach the capital along the ancient city walls. The citadel itself cannot be visited at present, but its environs are the meeting place of several memories and cultures, and from here it is the most brilliant view of the expanding city and to the sea below us. The nicest part of the downtown is the coastal promenade, and parallel to it are several avenues. The avenues, streets, squares, and churches bear names of famous persons and saints of the past, of whom the locals are rightly proud. The local university, for instance, took the name of Aristotle, who was the educator of Alexander the Great and a student of Plato. The Ignata Avenue bears the name of the former Via Ignatia, which was one of the most important transport ways leading from the Adriatic Sea to Byzantine. The Via Ignatia is also famous for the fact that the biblical apostle Paul passed along this way during his visits to Greek cities. Paul had a dream of founding a parish church in Thessaloniki and writing his famous letters in favor of fighting for the restoration of the moral order of the towns. Even today, the avenue is one of the most important junctions of the city. Here we can get to know the St. George Rotunda, an Emperor Galerius triumphal arch which was raised to the memory of the Emperor's victory over the Persian and illustrates lifelike scenes of the battle. On the place of the small Byzantine church called the Savior's Color Change, once stood an imperial palace. In those times, Galeria's triumphal arch was connected by a double dome to another triumphal arch, which has since been destroyed. The monumentality of the architectural block was emphasized by a column row. The Hagia Sophia cannot be mentioned on the same day with its namesake in Istanbul, as what we see here is not a light-architected Byzantine church, but an early Roman basilica. Of course, we can visit several other churches in the city, but the most interesting is the Aya Paraskevi, which is built on the former site of a Roman villa. Part of the mosaic flooring of the villa is still visible today. The rounded fortress called Red Tower, standing on the coast and operating as a Turkish prison, was painted white in order to cleanse it from crime. The impressive remains of the former Venetian fortress are called White Tower today. Next to it, on the coastal promenade of the city, stands the horse statue of glorious Alexander the Great. In the round tower that is also the symbol of the city, we may find a museum of local history. With its endowments, Stavros is unique even in Greece. With its generous simplicity, nearness to nature, boisterous cliffs, partially wild yet marvelously inviting coves, with a spacious sublimity which dominates the whole region. This wonderful land gave a lot of grand seasoned men to the world, who at the right moment in history proved their bravery and suitability thus enriching the historical, tactical, philosophical, and cultural legacy of humanity. King Philip II, the father of all-conquering Alexander the Great, the first developer of the Macedonian great power, the inventor of famous Greek combat tactic and strategy, the Macedonian phalanx, was born and spent his youth here. Macedonia can attribute the prosperity of its mental, artistic, cultural, and scientific life to them. Here extends the long, sandy coast of South Macedonia, with nice health resorts, 
Stavros Asprovalta Amphipolis. The marvel of the place is that when the weather is clear, the view reaches as far as Trachea from the coast. Sunbathing on the soft, smooth sand of the pleasant, spacious coves is a pleasure. The village Sarti, located on the coast, bears the name of the ancient city of Sarti, which was the property of the Zeropotamu Monastery, located to the east of the coast on Mount Athos. The present Sarti was built and shaped by refugees. They formed the uninhabited wooded coastland, cultivated it, planted grapes, put their boats to the sea. Seeing the result, we can say that this picturesque place was worth the effort. The village along the seaside is an ideal place for relaxing. The area abounds in beautiful landscapes, sandy coves small and large, snow-white cliffs scattered here and there, the caressing sky-blue sea. Boat trips to Mount Athos depart from Sardi. The Greek have always had a special intimate contact to metaphysics. Universally valid thoughts fill the whole country and are important parts of the national consciousness. Also this established the independent republic isolated from the world in the monastery of the Athos Mountain. And it's just this inaccessibility that makes it special. According to an imperial bull from 1060, the area is still forbidden for women, children, and female animals, but even adult men are only allowed to enter with a special permission called Diamoni Trion. Even pleasure boats are allowed only within 500 meters of the seaside as they also transport women and children. According to legend, the holy mountain was named after the giant called Athos, who with his fellow giant was longing for the power of the Olympian gods. In the fight, he threw the mountain to one of his opposing gods, and this is what the terrain seems to prove. The monks living here believe that the winds brought Virgin Mary to Athos Mountain, and she declared the mountain to be her own garden where no other woman can set foot. The people here live in organized hermit community groups following monastery rules. Originally, 20 monasteries were built on the peninsula and the foundation of further ones was prohibited by charter. In the inaccessible parts of it, we can see several hermit cottages and caves hollowed into the cliffs. From our ship trip, we arrived to have a swim, rest and lunch on Sikia Beach. Refugees from Asia Minor established Neophokia in 1922. The formerly small settlement long extending along the sea has today become a dynamically developing center of tourism with its sandy beach and crystal clean water. One of the memories of the spread of Christianity is the famous St. Paul Spring. The St. Paul Tower standing on the coast hill can be seen easily from various points of the city. The tower was built in 1407 in order to protect the entrance of the Cassandra Peninsula from the north and also to guard the property of the Iopavlu Monastery. From the other buildings of the estate, only one chapel remained. Greek life seems uncommonly calm for us, and the Greeks have the unrivaled ability of being able to appreciate the smallest gifts of life. Perhaps this is also one of the reasons why this country attracts us so much, and we almost spontaneously try to learn the secrets of the Greek people. Everywhere we travel in the country, we run across myths and legends. It's no coincidence, as we're walking in the land of legends. From mythology, we're familiar with the famous Mount Olympus as the permanent residence of the 12 main gods. The range has 52 peaks with high plateaus, small lakes, springs, and many plants, from which 23 are such rarities they can only be found here. Its highest peak is the 2,917 meter high Mitibus, high above the clouds. In spring and autumn, fog often covers the mountains, and in summer, cloudbursts wash it. Even in the greatest heat wave, it has parts still covered in snow. The mountain is a protected natural park where shooting, skiing, and camping are prohibited, and only climbing is allowed. To 
tours depart from Lito Horos at the bottom of the mountain, and the tourist path leads up to 2,000 meters with shelter houses on the way. From here, there's still three hours to the top, but this is only recommended to experienced alpinists. Even if we refrain from climbing to the top, we can still have unforgettable sights by looking down from the mountain. Resting our eyes on the orderly little inhabited settlements below and the wonderful azure blue water of the Aegean Sea. Passing the Olympus to the south going towards the sea, on the side of a mountain thickly covered by oak trees, we discovered the medieval castle of Platamonas, which according to legend is called Xro Tis Orias, namely the beautiful woman's castle. The castle is characterized by Byzantine and Frankish architecture. Its walls are polygonal with jetting towers and bastion walls with small stones. Its entrances and inner courtyard are protected by several squared bastions. The Tempe Valley separates Macedonia and Thessaly between the Olympus and Osa Mountains. The 10-kilometer-long, narrow and deep precipice was already famous in ancient times. According to myths, the sea god Poseidon divided the mountain in a fit of anger. There are countless springs in the valley, and as water is of rare value here, this was considered a gift of the gods, and by way of thanks, they were named after them. The most famous are the spring of Daphne Nymph, Aya Paraskevi's spring that heals eye diseases, and Aphrodite's spring that, according to the saga, gives back beauty and youthfulness. The myth says that after defeating the dragon, Apollo came here to clean himself in the water of the Peneus River. The valley and its church are famous places of pilgrimage. Katerini is a county town with 50,000 inhabitants, 70 kilometers to the south of Saloniki. Its coastal bathing place is the picturesque Paralia, 6 kilometers from it. The pleasant holiday resort has plenty of hotels, restaurants, and fancy shops in the downtown. Life is busy from early morning to late evening. Several taverns, open-air discotheques, sometimes folk dance shows await visitors. For miles, the coast of Paralia consists of a spread of connected free beaches. Swimming and sunbathing provide genuine pleasure on the smooth golden sand of the beach its expanse is broken only by the piers reaching gracefully into the water and a small stone bridge. There's no other view in the world like the Meteora Monastery. Medieval people who were continuously searching for signs of a higher power considered the huge cliffs a work of God, created by Him as home for the hermits who were in contact with the heavens. The first hermits had tired of the Byzantine inner struggles during the 11th century and found shelter in this hidden place. Father Nilos, the superior of the Dupien Monastery, founded the first monastery community in 1367 from the hermits living here and the monks escaping from the Turkish. The first monastery, built on the top of a 600-meter cliff, was named the Great Meteorion. The sextons living here and advocating Cenobite principles were not only afraid of the mundane pleasures of the world, but also of women, as the devil is afraid of incense smoke. The ascetic monks kept women away until the most recent decades, and even today women are admitted only if attired appropriately. The monasteries were obsessed with their isolation, and the few visitors they did receive were pulled up by a kind of winch in a net woven of ropes. Today, these nets are used only for transporting goods. Modern ages urging change and yielding to the demands of tourism made it feasible to cut stairs into the cliffs and build small bridges over the precipices. Tourists can leave their cars and spend the night in Kalambaka village at the bottom of the cliffs. A unique view compensates us for the efforts of climbing so many stairs. The delta of the rivers running to the sea millions of years ago left us these rock columns of several hundred meters as remembrances. First the great Meteorion was built on these and later the others, the Varlam, Rosano, Holy Trinity, St. Stephen, and St. Nicholas Anapausis monasteries. The son of the Serbian Grand Duke Uros, Yoasov, who was also related to the Byzantine imperial family, turned away from the world and became a monk when he was very young. 
His relatives' donations and charters strengthened the financial situation and political influence of the great Metarion. It already seemed there would not be enough cliff peaks for the monasteries since their number rose to 25 in the course of the 15th century. Their decline was not the outcome of the Turkish conquest. The monasteries entered a moral crisis due to seemingly endless rivalry, a jockeying for position, and constant inner struggles. The number of monks started to decrease. More and more buildings became vacant. The most striking proof of the changes is not that a few dozen monks guide tourists in the monasteries, but the fact that today, nuns also live here. The Greek capital is located in the southern part of the country, where the Peloponnesus and the Attica peninsulas meet. The most well-known construction of Athens is its citadel, the Acropolis, which is crowned by the golden yellow columns of the Parthenon. The majestic buildings were built on a 156-meter mountain. The Propylaia, the gate of the Acropolis, is a decorative entrance hall, which is a deserving opening for the great view awaiting us. It really does exist, and it looks exactly the same as we learned in school, shouted Sigmund Freud when he first saw the Parthenon. The sanctuary is not only the most significant building of the Acropolis, but also indisputably the main work of the classical ages, and through its sculptures, it's even the unique representative of the Phidia style. Construction on the most perfect Greek church was begun in 447 BC, under the direction of Ictinos and Callicrates. Its sculptures were made by the greatest artists of the age, Phidias. The length of the colonnade standing on a limestone foundation is 70, its width is 31 meters. The height of the Doric pillars is 10.5 meters. Goethe exclaimed, it seems as if the whole church is singing. The Erechtheum is the most mysterious building of the Acropolis. It got its name from the king buried here, Erechtheus. Probably this was the site of the as yet unexcavated Musine Palace. Perhaps this gives an explanation for the strangeness of the building. There's no trace of the usual Greek symmetry, and perhaps uniform stone flooring were not built in order to leave uncovered the shrines and tombs hiding below. The Museum of the Acropolis was founded in 1878 and partly situated underground so as not to disturb the panorama of the plateau. Priceless metopes, friezes, reliefs, and sculpture fragments are exhibited here, namely all that was not destroyed or has not been delivered to various museums of the world. A collection of such a range of archaic statues hidden underground at the Persian Wars cannot be seen anywhere else. The oldest caryatid found on the Acropolis, originating from 580, holds a pomegranate in her hands. The caryatids, with their Doric robes clinging to their bosoms and thighs, illustrate the triumph of femininity and youthfulness. Thomas Bruce, Elgin's seventh earl, took a great liking to them, and in 1803, the British ambassador to Turkey collected the crumbling statues of the Acropolis and delivered them to the British Museum in London, where they're still on exhibit. The reconstruction of the two tympanums of the Parthenon could only partially rely on the pieces found and as many elements are missing, a lot of guesswork was involved. Already in the middle of the 1800s, it was known where Agora, the marketplace of ancient Athens, was located. However, for its excavation, 350 buildings had to be demolished, and some 300,000 tons of debris had to be transported. Agora used to be the center of political, commercial, and social life of the city-state. The shops, churches, court, and other public buildings were standing on the trapezoid-shaped flat area. The stoa was a columned market hall, which had been built by the ruler Atalos of Pergamon, framing the eastern part of the main square. On the hill crowning the Agora stands the least ruined ancient Greek church, the Hephaestion, which was named after the mythological smith of the Olympus. The construction of the church had been started a decade before that of the Parthenon, the works were even interrupted for a while because the building of the great church consumed all money and energy. A guidebook features the following entry. It's a special feeling to walk in a genuine Doric church with ceiling and walls still standing. The metopes, reliefs, the seasoned yellow massive pillars are in their original places, rising from the bed of flowers at their feet, 
like they did 2,400 years ago when the ruined agora of today was full of life. The Roman agora is located on the area of Plaka. This archaic-style quarter of Athens is characterized by narrow alleys and a genuine bazaar. The mosque of the bazaar is one of the few Turkish memories in the city that has remained intact. However, we can surely consider the bazaar itself the little brother of the great bazaar in Istanbul. Hazelnuts and Greek flags, bags, t-shirts decorated with Greek patterns and other clothes are sold here. We can buy souvenirs and copies of Greek antiques, devotional objects, icons, old coins, genuine Greek music on CD, and of course, food and drinks. Fruits are in abundance. Large grapes, figs, oranges, spices, several kinds of olive oil, and olives. The most well-known drinks of Greece are the anise-flavored ouzo and the famous metaxa, as well as the fine resin-flavored wine, retsina. There are several varieties of these, also in decorated boxes. Many of the goldsmiths and jewelers prepare their pieces on the spot. The shops of the elegant pedestrian zones and the outdoor street cafes here, denying their identity, are Western-styled. Long ago, Byron and Shelley and Heinrich Schliemann, the archaeologist who excavated Troy, lived nearby. The building of the parliament was built as a palace and it seems anachronistic in the Greek capital. Friedrich von Gärtner, Munich architect, planned it for Otto Wittelsbach in German neoclassic style. The most significant Bavarian ruler, Otto, the son of Ludwig I, was also Greek king for a short period. He was expelled by the revolutionaries, but before that, they forced the constitution out. In its memory, the square in front of the parliament was called Syndagma, meaning constitution. On the square in front of the parliament, soldiers wearing unique uniforms and shoes with pom-poms stand on duty. They're called Evson, namely well-dressed, and the changing of guard is a real tourist spectacle. Beyond the city, the Attica Mountains appear blue and in the distance there's the sea, the Gulf of Saros. The part of the bay between Athens and Cape Sunion was called Apollo in ancient times. Later the area fell in a long sleep and only in 1922 did it begin to become repopulated when thousands of Greeks escaped from Asia Minor and settled here. However, only the appearance of mass tourism brought a real upswing. Since those times, the area has been called Arica Riviera. The romantic nature of the rocky coast between Kalamaki and Glyfada rivals with the beauty of the Greek islands. On the southern tip of the Attica Peninsula is the Sounion, which was sung about in the Odyssey. Whether viewed from the road or water, the 70-meter-high Sounion Acropolis can be recognized from afar with the pillars of the Temple of Poseidon on top. Above the small circular bay on the cliff top, a fortress was raised in 400 BC to be able to guard the entrance of the Gulf of Saros. There are genuine Greek taverns along the coast. Grapes growing on trellises overhead provide patrons with cooling shade. The furniture is simple, wicker chairs, tables covered with the traditional blue and white tablecloths. One can never tire of the view of the sea or the aroma and flavor of the local food. The 3.5 meter thick semicircular wall of the old fortress is still visible. Once there were watchtowers standing every 20 meters, but not many of them have remained, just as only the foundation walls of Athena's sanctuary have survived. But 19 of the 34 marble pillars of the Temple of Poseidon have resisted the attack of thousands of years. Each evening, the small plateau fills with tourists admiring the sunset over the Aegean Sea. As the poet wrote, Helios, with his farewell ray, covers the pearl color back of the sea in scarlet gold from his sinking chariot. Perios lies 10 kilometers to the southwest of the center of Athens. The rocky peninsula called Acti defensively encircles a larger and smaller bay, which is an ideal anchor place. Due to this, Perios was the most important harbor of Athens already in ancient times and has since become a part of the capital. Gigantic-sized cruisers, ferry boats, luxury ships, and cargo ships alike dock here, and thanks to this, there's always plenty of action. Along the ancient defense walls, many tourists walk around the winding coastal ways of the southwestern part of the Acti Peninsula, enjoying the panorama of the sea, islands, and the mountains standing blue in the distance. 
The former army harbor was called the Zia Freatis. Its present name is Pasalimano, and it's full of snow-white luxury yachts and private sailing boats. The circular 400-meter-wide windless bay lies on the eastern side of the promontory. We find Corinth 60 kilometers from Athens to the west. In order to avoid sailing around the whole Peloponnesus Peninsula, a canal was built in ancient times when smaller ships were pulled by horse carriages between the Aegean and the Ionian Sea. Along this path, Emperor Nero already wanted to build a canal to enable the transportation of bigger ships as well. However, his plan didn't come true and was only realized in 1882. At this time, construction began on the 6.4 kilometer long, 80 meter deep, and at its narrowest point, 23 meter wide Corinth Canal, which was completed in 1893. Today, even 10,000 ton water vehicles pass it. The solution used at the bridge of the Corinth Canal is unique, because the bridge doesn't rise, but sinks. If the bridge guard recognizes a coming ship, he strikes a gong to indicate that the bridge is soon going to close. When the traffic is stopped, he starts the winches which sink the bridge. The ship goes through and the bridge rises again. This can happen as often as a hundred times a day. Corfu is the most well-known Ionian island. One of its attractions, the neoclassical Achilleon Castle, was built in 1863 by order of Queen Sissi, according to an Italian architect's plans. The Queen paid great attention to the excavations of Schliemann, walked all over the scenes of the Trojan War, and collected ancient objects. She named her palace after her favorite hero. After her death, German Emperor Wilhelm bought the palace, which today is a tourist attraction. Already in the 5th century, a castle was standing in place of the old fortress. This was strengthened by the Byzantine and the Goths. The capital was placed here as protection against the attacks of the Vandals and Slavs. Later, the buildings were connected by underground mazes, and the whole construction was encircled by a moat. The overhanging bridge leads to the promenade. The exhibition in the fortress displays the more than 400-year Venetian reign. The neoclassical building standing on the northern part of the main square contained the offices of the English governors. After the withdrawal of the British, it became the residence of the Greek royal family. Today, an Asian collection is exhibited there. The crowning jewel of the main square is the arcaded building of Liston. This was modeled after the Rue de Rivoli by the engineer Lesseps, the father of the builder of the Suez Canal. Once, only noblemen were allowed to walk there. Today, it's a tourist attraction. Not far from the airport, next to the Halikiopulo Lagoon, is the most visited and most photographed site of Corfu, the Vlaharaina Monastery. The simple white church with bell tower is the symbol of the island, built on a small peninsula, and can be approached from the mainland by a narrow pedestrian bridge. Behind it is the romantic and extremely green Ponticonisi, otherwise known as the Mouse Island, where the white stairs winding among the evergreens lead to a small nunnery. Sidari is the most popular holiday resort of the area. Its typical striped sandstone walls preserving the marks of thousands of years, its cliff shapes formed by water and wind appear on every postcard of Corfu. The local attraction is the Canal d'Amour, the channel of love, which ensures believing couples that if they swim through it together, they will never separate. Sidari is not only a bathing place, but also departing point of boat trips. We can sail from here to Diaponta Island, to Paleocastrizza, and to Cassiope. One point of the mountain above Paleocastrizza was named intentionally Bella Vista, meaning nice view. The panorama seen from the terrace of the cafe is one of the nicest in the world. The two bays are separated by a narrow neck of land and the cliffs are covered with lush vegetation. The cliffs rising out from the sea are worth a closer look. Several smaller rock hollows have been formed here. The sunshine reflecting through the water from the bottoms of the caves creates seemingly unreal hues of blue and green. 
the local boatmen will be more than happy to show these places, which are reminiscent of the famous Blue Cave of Capri. Homer said that Odysseus, otherwise known as Ulysses, and Nausicaa met here. With its 260-kilometer length, Crete is called the Great Island by the Greeks. Its capital, Iraklion, was the harbor of Knossos in ancient times and later the most significant slave market of the Mediterranean area was here. It was ruled by Arabs, Byzantines, and Venetians. The arched ruins of the Venice dry dock still stand yet today. The ships of the famous Venetian fleet were constructed and maintained in the arsenal. Today, it affords welcome shade to tourists visiting here. Knossos, the center of Minoan civilization, is only five kilometers from the capital. The palace complex was excavated by British archaeologist and linguist Arthur Evans in the 19th century. The most substantial events of Greek mythology played here, such as the defeat of the guard of the labyrinth, Minotaurus, by the help of Ariadne's thread, or the flights of Daedalus and Icarus. These legends are still fascinating, which is shown by the millions of tourists drawn to Knossos every year. The beach of Matala is bordered by a steep sandstone wall. Even before Christ, hermits made their homes in the hollows of the wall. In the 1960s and 70s, hippies and easy riders found peace for their rebellious souls here and moved into the caves, which are today tourist attractions. Ios Nikolaos is built on the small peninsula of the picturesque Mirabello Bay, a town beautifully situated on the Mediterranean. Its saltwater lagoon lake is surrounded by steep cliffs and a small bridge spans its narrow exit to the sea. Small boats set anchor on the lake and sailboats in the bay, while fishing boats supply the restaurants of the coast with fresh fish and other seafood. The small sloping streets all cross in the bay and at the harbor. The streets are lined with shops and eateries. From Ios Nikolaos, we can go on special trips to the ruins of the sunken pirate city Alos or to Spinalonga, called the Isle of Tears. Kania is the second most populated city of Crete. It's preserved its picturesque medieval face even today. A motor raft delivers visitors to the restaurant standing on the pier. The narrow, winding alleys of the old town and the medieval Venetian and Turkish houses mixed with the 19th century neoclassic buildings are a fascinating mix. To all this, the Lefka Ori mountain provides dramatic scenery in the background. The attraction of Kania is a handsome cab by which tourists are taken around the old town. The majority of the three-kilometer city wall is still intact. Starting from the fortress named Castelli, we can walk along on the edge of the bay in front of the long queue of shops on the ground floors of the Venetian Patricians' houses. The classic film Zorba the Greek was shot near Kania. The film was written by the greatest son of Crete, Nikos Kazantzakis, and Theorodakis composed its music. Opposite the Naval Museum stands Firka Tower, where the current Greek flag, blue and white striped and decorated with a cross, was first hoisted. Kania today is the second largest city of the island and was at one time also the capital. The peak of natural beauties of Crete is the Samaria Ravine, which is part of the world heritage. The majestic rock pinnacles occasionally hide shyly behind the clouds. A long, winding highway leads to the entrance of the National Park. From Siliscalo, narrow stairs lead down into the ravine, and with its protected plants, a kind of mufflin, and its cliff formations, it provides an unforgettable experience. The precipice reaches the sea after 18 kilometers at Aya Rumeli. Tourists can have a rest here and return to Cora Scafion by boat. Rhodes is the largest member of the Dodoconesos Archipelago. The prosperity of the island was mentioned by Homer several times since it acquired colonies in Asia Minor and in the territory of modern-day France even in times before Christ. The city was built on the grounds of three ancient palaces in 408 BC and it was put on the map by being named one of the seven wonders of the world, the Colossus of Rhodes. 
The modern city mixes the ancient network of streets and medieval Gothic buildings with Oriental-style minarets and mosques. The center of the old town is the Hippocrates Square, decorated with a fountain. There's a nice view of the lively square from the terraces of the surrounding taverns and restaurants. The busy streets with several little shops are like a Turkish bazaar, which is no coincidence since we are in the Turkish district. The Osmanli, as in the case of every conquered area, left their mark on this place in the form of Turkish baths, mosques, and minarets. In the harbor stands St. Stephen's Cathedral, which is known for its clock tower, and next to it is the ornamented building of the Prefecture, a remnant of Italian occupation. Nea Agora, the Moorish-style marketplace, and the beach fit well into this environment. The Johannite military order worked on roads from 1306 to 1522. The Street of the Knights, which is one of the most pleasant parts of the city, starts from the Palace of the Grand Master. The surprisingly sound ancient monument itself would warrant a visit to the island of Rhodes. The Order of the Militant Monks, who wore red vests decorated with a crucifix over their chain armor, became extremely wealthy by obtaining, with papal assistance, the fortune of their rival, the dissolved Order of the Temple. Their fleet of black galleys played a significant role in commercial shipping. Meanwhile, they were continuously working on fortifying their towns. The 15-meter-thick castle walls rebuted even two Ottoman attacks, but they couldn't defy the 100,000-strong army of Suleiman I and the Sultan conquered Rhodes. Afterwards, the knights were expelled to the island of Crete, then Malta, and their order has been known as the Order of Malta ever since. The second most visited place of the island is Lindos. The harbor can be seen clearly from the mountain where Apostle Paul was believed to have found shelter from the stormy sea. The white houses frame the mountain like a collar on which the gray citadel stands. First, a temple devoted to Athena was erected on the 120-meter-high cliff. Then a castle was built on this place in Byzantine times, which was later altered to a real fortress by Johannite knights. The Acropolis of 8.5 square meters can be reached only after a long walk up the stairs. Riding a donkey for this journey is not so tiring and much more exciting. By the way, the donkey is a characteristic means of transport in Greece, so it's worth getting familiar with it. Because of increased tourist trade, the village has been beautifully renovated. Almost every house has opened a shop, tavern, bar, or ice cream bar where we can find the indispensable souvenirs or taste the specialties of Greek cuisine. Luckily, multi-storied hotel complexes are unknown here. Instead, small, familiar six- to eight-room guest houses can be found. The residents here can make a trip to the Valley of Butterflies, a specialty of Rhodes. The island of Kos is called the Island of Peace, Soul, and Tranquility, yet it's still most widely known as the birthplace of Hippocrates. Everything here reminds us of the father of medicine. An extremely old sycamore tree stands behind the Johannite fortress where the students of Hippocrates used to sit in the shade and study the mysteries of medicine. The island is only eight kilometers away from the Turkish coast near the town of Bodrum, which was called Halikarnassus in ancient times. It seems as if the history book of Kos had been carbon copied from that of Rhodes. Its masters were first the Dorians, then the Achaeans. Later, it was conquered by Byzantium and Venice. In the 14th century, the Johannites did some fortifying work here. In 1522, it was conquered by the Ottomans, their mosques and minarets creating an oriental atmosphere in the city. The wide excavation area revealing the remains of the ancient marketplace is only a few steps away from the city center. The eight Corinthian pillars of a portico the remains of the Shrine of Aphrodite from the 4th century BC can be seen here, in addition to a three-nave Paleo-Christian basilica. The massive arches covered the town spa where citizens could swim in the warm water of the springs. The floors of spas, houses, and churches were decorated with mosaics. The modern marketplace and the market hall of the city can be found not far from Agora. Here, besides fresh vegetables and fruit, 
we can buy dried herbs, jams, flavored olive oil, and some oriental sweets. Asclepion is a 2,400-year-old healing place which was established after the death of Hippocrates, but in his spirit. One of the most important points of his doctrines was that he separated the sciences from the holy office. The place was named after the mythological figure, the son of Apollo. On the first floor of the four-story building were the spas and guest rooms. Healing took place in the porticos of the second and third floor, while the church was located on the top floor. Spa therapy, herbal cure, massage, even hypnosis, meditation, and special diets were used to treat people, making it very similar to the spas of today. The small island of Patmos is the northwest neighbor of Kos. Scala, the capital of the island, is the center of cultural life. The St. John Monastery and Fortress, surrounded by the White Houses of Hora, which is a major tourist attraction, towers above the city. Its skyline is similar to that of Lindus. From the road leading to the fortress, we can go off the track to reach the Cave of the Apocalypse, where, according to legend, the voice of God called St. John the Evangelist. A curving road leads up to the tranquil, intimate Hora, where apart from some cafes and shops selling trinkets, nothing can be found but serenity, sun-kissed stones, blooming oleanders, and a fascinating panorama. The silence and the view compensate us for the difficulties of the journey. The neighbors of Patmos, Leros, and Lipsy can be seen clearly from here, which despite their dramatic past are peaceful little islands inhabited by fishermen. Patmos, which was once under papal protectorate, has always been an ecclesiastical center. The golden-brown walls of the monastery are encircled by a scalloped molding. The building is a fanciful mixture of terraces, stairs, closed courtyards, arcades, and balconies that has gained its present form over many centuries. For a long time, Mykonos was mentioned only as a transit station among tourists who arrived to visit the excavation site of Delos. Then it became an outstanding holiday resort in the 50s and 60s. What's the secret of its success? Undoubtedly, everything can be found here, just like on other islands. White houses, typical of the Cyclades, line cobblestone narrow alleys winding on the basis of some incomprehensible logic. The shutter blinds and protruding wooden balconies protecting from the ferocious sun are painted colorfully. The colorful, gorgeous blossoms of hibiscus, oleanders, and climbing rose creep up the walls. Ships anchoring in the harbor, blue dome churches, and brown windmills make the landscape more lively and colorful. The stairs of whitewashed houses are packed full of pots of climbing geraniums. However, this would make the island hardly more than a tourist center. What stands out about Mykonos is that it's the favorite European holiday resort of Hollywood celebrities, rock stars, nudists, homosexuals, bohemian artists, aristocracy, and playboys. During the daytime, when the emperors of the nightlife are sleeping, the island is very similar to the other ones. Its special atmosphere can be felt by the candlelight on the terraces of the taverns in the shade of the gray barbers or reed shutters, indicating that evening has set. Islands who were frightened of the jealous Hera refused to accept the pregnant Leto. The infertile, barren Delos had nothing to lose, so the grandchild of the giants gave birth to the divine son of Zeus, Apollo. Leto brought prosperity to the island in gratitude. So much for mythology. In fact, Delos became a significant religious center in the 7th century BC. At that time, it was under the protection of Naxos. The continuously expanding Athens formed the Delian League after defeating the Persians. The treasures coming from taxes were carried to the Parthenon. At the same time, a complete cleaning of the island was ordered, even the graves were opened and the remains of the dead were removed. Birth and death were banned. Pregnant women and dying Delians were transported to another island. The long-forgotten event, the Delian Games, were revived when people used to sing and dance, organize performances, sport activities, and feasts in honor of Apollo.
The area of ruins spreading all over the island together with the little museum of Delos attracts people from all over the world who are fond of Greek culture and archaeology. A part of the antique Delos with a good atmosphere could have been the Saint Lake, which unfortunately has in the meantime dried out. The fragmented archaic lion statues have become a symbol of the island. Five lions out of the nine erected by Naxians have remained in Delos. One is in Venice and three are missing. On the Poseidon portico, the sanctuary of Leto and the stadium stood next to the lake. The 113-meter-high Mount Kintos, rather more of a hill, was also an important cult center, and later the theater quarter was created here. Today, the Greek theater and some partly reconstructed residential houses can be visited there. The single-storied residential homes were built around a marble-pillared, arched inner courtyard. The walls were decorated with frescoes, the floors with mosaics. The mosaics of the House of the Dolphins and the House of the Trident are particularly beautiful. Naxos, which used to be rich and of great significance in ancient times, cannot compete with Santorini and Mykonos today. The infrastructure of the biggest island of the Cyclades is now under construction. If we stand facing the scenic amphitheatrical town, the Palatia Peninsula with its famous marble gate can be seen on the left side, while Platia, the lively arched main square, on the right. The continuance of the main square is the promenade following the coastline. The Venetian castle and the surrounding romantic old town rise above it. The monumental marble gate is the remains of an unfinished Apollo temple from 26 centuries ago. From the main square, or the coastal promenade, we can walk up to Castro on winding and ever-ascending streets. This scenic part of town divided by stairs and arches is Burgos, inhabited chiefly by Orthodox believers. Everything that's important for tourism can be found in the trade district at the beach. Among the stores, gift shops, cafes and pubs, travel agencies, program offices, shipping companies, airlines, exchange offices, and car rentals can be found plus automatic teller machines and public telephones. Among the seven towers of the citadel, only one has remained. Behind the castle walls stands the Palace of the Duke. One of its wings houses the descendants of the family. Their coat of arms can still be seen above the entry. The other wing functions as a cultural venue. The island of Paros lies at the intersection of the routes of cruises in the Cyclades. Its gentle sloping hills are just as green as those of Naxos, only eight kilometers away. Nausa is the most beautiful settlement of the idyllic island. The dual bay, the little Venetian fortress standing in the water, the whitewashed houses or those made of natural stone, arched gateways, rocking fishing boats between the two rows of houses, the terraces of taverns, and colorful flowers turn the fishing village into an amazing sight. Every August, a hundred boats decorated with flaming torches commemorate a victorious sea battle from the 16th century. The islands of the Cyclades played a significant role in the history of civilization, even in prehistoric times. Paros has always been famous for its marble quarries. It supplied the material for Venus de Milo. Moreover, the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, as well as the gravestone of Napoleon, was built from this. A church, Panagia Hecaton Tapiliani, built partly of marble, stands in the capital city too. According to legend, the best student of the builder of Hagia Sophia in Istanbul created such a masterpiece in this temple that his envious master wanted to push him off the roof, but Ignatius dragged the teacher down and both of them died on the spot. We can also find here the ruins of a citadel, a Venetian fortress built by using the remains of an antique sanctuary, a Paleo-Christian basilica, an archaeological museum, a monastery, and baths from the 4th century. However surprising it is, not these, but the quaint pedestrian zones will leave a mark in the heart of tourists who visit the place. Colombitris, this one-of-a-kind beach, can be approached by car or motorboat from Nausa. The whims of nature cause such round and wrinkled stones to be formed like nowhere else in Greece. The varied rock formations embrace the silky, sandy bays. It's a wonderful place for those who wish to enjoy the pleasures of summer, sunshine and sea secluded from the world. It's almost untouched by mass tourism and paradoxically, 
This is why more and more people come to visit. The mountainsides of Tinos are dominated by vineyards and the valleys by olive groves. It's a quiet, tranquil, but cheerful island, overrun by noisy, milling crowds only twice a year. The pilgrimage in honor of the miraculous icon is held in March and August every year. It happened in 1940 that during the celebration, a Greek cruiser which was anchoring in the harbor was torpedoed by an Italian submarine. The monument and the memorial chapel in the harbor pay respect to the victims of this treacherous attack. Many pilgrims, in the hope of being healed, climb the hundreds of meters up to the temple built on the top of the hill, crawling on their knees. There are numerous shops in the streets leading from the harbor to the temple. Gifts, oriental sweets, spicy olive oils, and honey are sold here. However, the souvenirs that are sold in enormous quantities in the shops of Tinos are sacred images, devotional objects, candles, and icons. Panagia Evangelistria, the famous pilgrim church, was built of white marble in neoclassical style in the 1830s. Delian marble remains were also used in the building. There's a wide staircase leading to the closed yard, which is framed by decorative arched buildings from three sides. The miraculous icon is said to be the work of St. Luke, and it was found in 10th century crypt chapel by a nun, Sister Pelagia, who was later sainted by the church. The flower garden of the church is guarded by the statues of the former archbishop. In the small arcaded wing attached to the main building, apart from some other museums, the sacristy and seminary were provided for. The rather small church interior is full of lavish chandeliers, candlesticks, icons, devotional objects, incense burners, and pictures. The art gallery and the exhibition of local artists are also very interesting. The treasury and the Byzantine Museum, however, are simply impossible to miss. We should definitely see the touching mausoleum of the LA Cruiser. Newborn babies are baptized with the trickling water of the spring that is thought to have healing power. Santorini, lying 100 kilometers north of Crete, is the most beautiful island providing us with the essence of Hellas. The once rounded island shrank to a crescent shape due to a volcanic eruption in Minoan times. An active volcano, frequently spitting ashes and lava, used to stand on the place where now the sea shines in the Bay of the Crescent. In the 15th century BC, the volcano erupted. The mountain disappeared at that time, creating the present form of Santorini. The sea was ablaze for four days between Terra and Terracia, wrote an ancient author, when a two-kilometer-long flaming lava island, Palia Kameni, or the Old Stone, emerged from the ebullient sea. More recent eruptions frightened the islanders even in the 1950s, and near Nea Kamina, we can swim in warm water even today. The beach of Kamari, covered with black volcanic sand, can be found near the airport. The settlement was built at the foot of the oldest mountain of the Aegean Sea, Mesa Vuno, which was a harbor of Terra in ancient times. It was also sunk by a volcanic eruption until it was brought to surface again by another one in the last century. The village had to be rebuilt from its ruins after the earthquake in 1956. By today, Kamari has become the most prosperous and fast-developing resort of the island. It's popular and loved for its clean water and sandy beaches, as well as for a wide choice of water sports and activities. The intimate promenade is attractively framed by hotels of varying categories. Akrotiri is considered to be one of the most significant excavations in the world today. A French geologist took notice of the pieces of rocks which turned up from under the tuff and this finally led to the excavation of the surprisingly sound 3,000-year-old town. It happened more than 50 years before Evans discovered the ruins of Knossos Palace on Crete, so nobody had the faintest idea about Minoan culture. The findings appearing sometimes from under 15-meter-deep volcanic ashes confirmed the assumptions of Marintos, a famous archaeologist, concerning the expanded Minoan Empire working with Crete as its center. 
The white houses of its capital, Fira, crowd all in a heap in a lively extravaganza. Every curve of the narrow winding alleys larded with stairs shows yet another miracle. The 587-stair journey from Fira to the harbor of Scala, where pleasure boats depart to the little nearby islands, can be taken on donkey back or cable railway. Tourists relax in swimming pools, the sun beats down on our necks, the salty fragrance of the sea tickles our noses, and gleaming white boats float towards unknown destinations. The appearance of Ia is thought to outshine even that of the capital city, Fira. The mixture of the colorful houses is the embodiment of a Greek dream itself. There's simply no travel agency without a brochure full of pictures luring tourists to Hellas. The unique architecture of Santorini is defined by its geographical position. Here, people managed to make a virtue of necessity. The island was poor in water, wood, and food. Poverty-stricken families made use of the quite good workability of pyrogenous pumice and dug out cavern houses in the steep side of the caldera. The volcanic rock from the mountain was used as building material. The cradle vault, due to lack of wood, was made of stone. The cave was incredibly high and light and water penetrated through the door. The living room was to the front and to the rear the bedroom, where less light penetrated. Wealthier people later added porches to the caverns. The terraces are separated by small plastered stone fences and little wooden gates. The streets are replaced or supplemented by winding stairs. The usage of white, blue, and recently pastel shades are just as characteristic as the decorations. The style itself is called Aegean or Cycladis. Ia was built at the end of the road after the caldera and was the economic and administrative center of the island until the Second World War. The earthquake in 1956 mainly destroyed it and it was a sorry sight for a long time. What we see today has been built during the last 20 years preserving traditions, but also considering the needs of tourists. The base area of Ia is not great, but the winding streets can allow us to roam for days if we want to get to know the city well. We can admire the small details, the flooring of the terraces, the door knockers and the flower pots that remind us of old Greek amphora, the wrought iron lamps. From the several churches of Ia, Ios Sasson and St. Mary are worth mentioning. The first blue-domed, snow-white Greek Orthodox churches were built in the Middle Ages, in the spirit of demonstration against the quickly spreading Catholicism. Actually, this national religious resistance is the reason for the incredibly high number of Orthodox churches all over Greece, and so also in Santorini. For instance, the nearby Anafi Island is famous for the fact that the number of chapels or churches almost equals that of the population. Robert Merle wrote, but without him, many of us already thought, that reality often surpasses the imagination. When it comes to Santorini, we can feel it, especially in Ia. One hour before sunset, like swallows on the wire, tourists gather, mostly equipped with video recorders and cameras, in order to stop time, to record what is unrecordable. The sun is shining like melting gold. It still stands high, but its shadows are growing longer and the incredible blue of the sky takes on a purple shade. Then the snow-white walls start to darken, lamps light up here and there, or a candle on a table of one of the terraces. The sun reaches the end of its daily journey and almost exhausted sinks into the sea. Reverent silence grasps this moment. Then gradually, nightlife begins. The streets fill up with people and the terraces of the tavernas are soon full. Over a glass of ouzo or retsina, promises are made, next year, again, same time, same place.